Good morning. Um, welcome to Echo Rounds today, May 21st. Um, it's uh, Ra Han. I'm a pediatric cardiologist here at St. Michael's Hospital, and I'll be presenting today on um, COVID-19 and Kawasaki disease, exploring the association and cardiac complications. Uh, feel free um, during the presentation to please speak up and ask any questions for any clarification. Um, it'll be, it should be a, an interactive um, presentation today. So the learning objectives for today um, are to review the clinical features and cardiac complications of Kawasaki disease, um, explore the association between COVID-19 and Kawasaki disease, and discuss the indication and timing of echocardiography in children with COVID-19. So a brief history of Kawasaki disease. So this is Professor Tamasaku Kawasaki. He's a general pediatrician in Japan, and he identify the first case of Kawasaki disease, um, or what he termed a mucocutaneous um, ocular syndrome in 1961, where he saw that um, child presented with a self-limiting febrile illness, um, then developed a desquamation um, of his extremities, which seemed quite unusual for something that was not staff related. Um, he um, uh, presented uh, his case series, um, to the Japanese Medical Council um, in 1964. And at that time, a lot of people doubted that this was actually something that was novel, that they felt this was likely an atypical presentation of um, other potential um, illnesses. And you'll see that that will be a, a, um, a, a recurring topic with this specific condition. But soon after he presented his case series, there was a child with a history of the same um, illness who died suddenly, and an autopsy was found to have coronary artery uh, thrombosis. So subsequently, the Japanese um, government conducted a national epidemiologic survey to determine the incidence of Kawasaki disease in their population and identified 10 patients um, who had a history of Kawasaki disease who died suddenly and had the same coronary artery aneurysm. So the um, epidemiologic link was made. At the same time, coronary angiography was increasingly being used uh, for cardiac diagnoses in children. Um, and they were able to identify coronary artery aneurysms in children with Kawasaki disease. Um, so the case series was eventually, there were lots of publications in, in Japanese, but the case series was eventually published in English in 1974. And around that same time, there were pediatricians in Hawaii who were recognizing the same illness, um, particularly among the children of Japanese descent, but also in the general population as well. And so then, um, because they were able to access the English language um, uh, publications, the link was made. And the CDC came with a case definition um, in 1978, and from then on, uh, tracked cases in the United States. The same case definition is being used now. So in the 40 plus years um, since the case definition was made and really almost 60 years um, since Dr. Kawasaki identified the clinical features, there hasn't been um, much progress in terms of a specific um, diagnostic test for this um, condition. So let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology. This is, uh, the incidence is approximately 25 per 100 children less than five years of age. So this was actually a study I, I did as a medical student um, in, uh, in 2000, where um, I surveyed all Ontario hospitals for new diagnosis of Kawasaki disease over a three year period, and there were 430 cases. And you can see the age distribution. So um, from less than five really was the highest um, incidence. Um, 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 uh, Asian ethnicity was a significant risk factor. There's a the incidence in Japan is actually closer to 200 per 100 uh, children less than five years of age. Um, there is a male uh, predisposition. If you had previous Kawasaki disease, the likelihood that you would have Kawasaki disease again was approximately 3%. So recurrence risk of 3% is quite high, um, particularly given that there's a, a quite a small narrow window of time um, during which the children could potentially um, develop this again. And if you had a sibling with Kawasaki disease, the likelihood that you develop Kawasaki disease was 2%. If you were an identical twin, it was up to 13%. So clearly there was a genetic um, uh, uh, predisposition that uh, made you more vulnerable to developing Kawasaki disease. And this has been borne out in more recent studies um, looking at specific alleles, although the 
the genetic testing hasn't been um, clinically relevant in terms of how we would approach um, the, the disorder currently. There is a seasonality in temperate climates. So in North America, the likelihood of Kawasaki disease um, goes up in the winter months. Um, so that raises the question whether there is a potential viral or infectious factor um, that's contributing. Um, in other areas, um, there's not. Um, in epidemiologic studies, they've identified um, uh, professional rug cleaning as a potential risk factor, again, not borne out in, in other studies. Um, and so there is, has not been a specific trigger or cause that have been identified in the past 60 years that we've known about this disease. And the, in the acute phase, the main pathology is a systemic um, inflammatory response. And it's an aseptic meningitis, causes an interstitial pneumonitis. Uh, from a cardiac standpoint, a myocarditis, pericarditis, valvulitis, particularly mitral valve regurgitation, and nonspecific GI symptoms such as abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, um, pyuria, so an aseptic pyuria with an increased white count but no negative culture, um, hepatitis, pancreatitis, and high drops of the gallbladder. In the subacute phase, it, also it can also cause an arthritis. And again, not a specific organism um, identified as, a, as an underlying trigger or pathology. So the clinical diagnosis remains unchanged for the past few decades. The um, classic or typical Kawasaki disease is defined by fever for more than five days and at least four of these five criteria. And this includes a whole body rash, which tends to be a macular papular um, and non-vesicular rash, a bilateral conjunctivitis, which is non-exudative um, and non-purulent, um, a strawberry tongue uh, with dry cracked lips, erythema and swelling of the palms and soles, and a cervical lymphadenopathy where the lymph node is greater than 1.5 centimeters. Now, each of these findings are nonspecific. There are um, uh, multiple other particularly viral illnesses that can cause similar symptoms, and um, they're not uh, always sensitive. So the cervical lymphadenopathy is only identified in about 43% of uh, patients who are um, ultimately diagnosed with Kawasaki disease. So even though this is the, the best we have so far, it's neither sensitive nor specific in, in identifying Kawasaki disease. In the subacute phase, there's desquamation, so peeling of the skin around the fingers and toes. Um, now that tends to be a much more specific for Kawasaki disease. Unfortunately, this is something that happens in the subacute phase. So it happens after you've passed the window where you'd wanna treat um, or, and reduce the likelihood of there being cardiac complications. And so sometimes the, the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease is made in retrospect once the desquamation happens. Um, the diagram demonstrates sort of the time course of the various findings. The, the timeline at the bottom is not completely uh, correct. Um, fever should defervesce within the first uh, two weeks um, and should really not recur. And the coronary aneurysms, if you don't have them by the time you're about four to six weeks along, you're very unlikely to develop them. So the time course is, is not completely correct, but the sort of the distribution and flow sort of illustrates um, the different phases. So diagnosis of Kawasaki disease, fever for five days and at least four out of the five acute clinical features. But atypical or incomplete Kawasaki disease, if you have fever for five days um, with two or three clinical features and a high CRP or ESR. Um, uh, with additional lab findings um, or abnormal echo findings. And then lots of uh, potential confounding factors, so multiple viral illnesses, um, uh, pneumococcus um, um, as well, in addition to staph and, and strep, um, drug reactions and rheumatologic conditions can appear very similarly. In the acute phase, the cardiac findings include a myocardial dysfunction, and this tends to be a diastolic um, dysfunction. And on MRI, um, you have evidence of myocardial edema indicating a, a, a myocarditis. Um, there can be a pericardial effusion, typically very mild, um, very rare to have tamponade. Um, about 25% of children will have mitral valve regurgitation, um, and in very rare cases, ventricular arrhythmia. Now, all these acute phase findings tend to be temporary. So once the inflammation resolves and the fever resolves, all of the acute findings tend to resolve completely as well. 
Um, in the subacute case, so after a week or two, um, then you start to see coronary artery dilation um, and coronary artery aneurysms. So if you do an echocardiogram in the initial um, febrile phase, these are uh, coronary findings are, are not necessarily present. So um, uh, in pediatrics, we diagnose coronary artery aneurysms on echocardiography. Um, so a transthoracic echocardiogram, particularly in the peristernal short axis view, um, looking at uh, coronary arteries and um, uh, the normal would be based on body surface area, um, looking at normal uh, compared to normal values. And if it's less than 2.5 uh, at a Z-score, it's likely a normal, a small coronary artery aneurysm would be less than five millimeters, medium five to eight, and then giant sort of greater than eight. Now these are absolute numbers because our natural history studies um, have used these absolute numbers uh, to sort of account for outcomes, but more recently we we're using z-scores because obviously a five millimeter coronary artery in a three-month-old is very different from a five millimeter coronary artery in a 14-year-old. Um, um, but um, you know we're sort of um, different um, countries and different institutions use different uh, values, but the the I guess the most um, uh, robust longitudinal information relates to the absolute values, unfortunately. And um, in rare cases, so particularly when there are giant aneurysms or symptoms, we may do coronary angiography, but that would be a rare occurrence. Um, and you would see uh, aneurysms, uh, and this would be the only way you would be able to image the distal um, aneurysms as well as to assess for any stenosis. Um, but this is a, a uh, arteritis not only of the coronary arteries, but of medium-sized arteries throughout the body. So you may um, notice aneurysms in the femoral artery or, or the brachiocephalic arteries, um, particularly if you do uh, an MRI or MRA. Unlike the coronary arteries, we tend not to worry so much about the systemic um, aneurysms as even if they become stenotic, children tend to develop collateralization very easily there. And so it's very rare that they develop any limb ischemia. So when do we do an echocardiogram in children with Kawasaki disease? If they have um, classic um, Kawasaki disease, or if they have incomplete Kawasaki disease with evidence of systemic inflammation. And it's not a one-time echocardiogram, it's at the time of initial diagnosis to assess for any myocardial dysfunction. Um, and, and then at one or two weeks, um, from the time of initial symptom onset to assess for coronaries at baseline, um, and then at four to six weeks to assess for any changes. Now, if by four to six weeks there have not been changes in the coronary arteries, they're unlikely to develop, um, but uh, a normal echocardiogram at diagnosis or one or two weeks doesn't mean that um, it'll be clear at four to six weeks. And so that serial follow-up becomes important. And that becomes important because sometimes when children have incomplete Kawasaki disease or clinical features that could be a, a number of different things, an echocardiogram is ordered to quote unquote rule out Kawasaki disease, but it can't. You can, you can have Kawasaki disease and not have coronary findings and you can have Kawasaki disease and not have coronary findings at the beginning, but may develop them in the subacute phase. And so it's important to convey to the referring physician that multiple studies need to be done. And so for these kids, it really, they need a cardiology consult. They can't just get an echocardiogram. And given the age of the children who develop Kawasaki disease, so median age around uh, two to three years of age, a lot of times they need sedation in order to be able to sit still to do a detailed coronary um, assessment. And so then that gets done um, at sick kids or at a hospital where they can do one-to-one -one nursing at the bedside. Um, and so it's not something that would typically be done, particularly at the time of diagnosis um, in an outpatient uh, setting. Follow-up scans can be done in an outpatient setting with uh, lots of patients in bribery. Um, and then subsequent studies will be based on, on previous findings. Any questions about the echocardiogram so far? Sorry, I tend to talk really fast, so interrupt me if, uh, if you need to. Okay, so in terms of uh, treatment, um, the gold standard for treatment is IVIG, intravenous yeah. chemoglobulin. Uh, um, I had a question about the echocardiogram. Sure. 
Um, like, I just remember, like, I did my medical school at the University of Alberta, and when they did pediatric echo, they were sometimes able to visualize coronary arteries. Is that like a routine goal, or is that just an incidental thing if you can see the coronaries in a kid? No, so assessing coronary arteries is a part of a pediatric echocardiogram. We do that in all of our, our children. Um, it's much more challenging in, the older the child is. Um, so and in teenager, um, uh, it, can, it can be quite difficult to assess the coronary arteries, but in, in younger kids, we routinely assess the coronaries. And if those coronaries look normal, do you feel like pretty fairly reassured or are you still, it, it's more up, you know, it's, if it's there, then it's, positive and if it's not there then you're not sure so it depends on why you're assessing the coronary arteries so if you're assessing them for kawasaki disease or if uh, patients are being referred because they have exertional symptoms then you want to be uh, quite clear that you saw the coronary arteries well or not well um, so that if further imaging needs to be done then that can be done um, but if they're coming in for some other reasons um, then uh, you may not be able to see the coronary arteries well, and that might be okay, as long as you sort of uh, note that down. But you need to be able to assess the coronaries in both 2D and in color to make sure that you're not getting sort of drop out and, and sort of false courses. Thank you so much. So I have a question as well then, Ra. It's Bob yeah. Howard. Um, how far distal can you see the coronaries in a child? Um, I mean, obviously, if there's an aneurysm at the origin, that's one thing, but the aneurysms can be more distal. So, you know, per, how often do you actually miss them? And, I, and then I guess the question is, if you find one, what do you do about it? So um, uh, you can see the coronary arteries um, out pretty far. Um, uh, I, I mean, almost out to the... Um, uh, I'll, I'll bring some images, uh, I think, next time we talk about pediatric echocardiogram, but the younger the child is, um, the further you can see the coronary arteries out. And uh, classically, we measure and look at coronary arteries in the parenosinal short axis view, but you can actually also see the coronary arteries in, um, in an apical four chamber view or a subcostal view. And particularly when there is myocardial edema or um, uh, or the, the coronary artery aneurysms, you can see them quite clearly. Um, absolutely, if there are only distal aneurysms, you would not be able to uh, see them, but um, um, about 80% uh, uh, of um, patients with distal aneurysms also have proximal aneurysms. And so if they're not symptomatic, um, we, we usually just stick with echo and we don't do um, angiograms. And if you find aneurysms, does that change your treatment? Absolutely. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well we talk, as we talk about the long-term outcomes as well. Very good questions. Thank you. So gamma globulin, uh, intravenous infusion of gamma globulin within the first 10 days of fever will reduce the likelihood of coronary artery aneurysms from 25% to about 4%. And that time becomes very important because if you give gamma globin after 10 days, the likelihood of coronary aneurysms stay in the double digits, as opposed to if you treat within the first 10 days of fever onset. Um, and so not only are we complicated by the difficulty in clinical diagnosis of Kawasaki disease because of overlapping features with lots of other conditions, um, there's also a, a time crunch. Um, and um, multiple randomized controlled trials and, and meta-analysis have demonstrated this, the importance of this time effect. We also give high-dose um, aspirin as an anti-inflammatory dose until the child is afebrile. Now, this is a little bit more variable. The reason that this is here is because when gamma globulin was being assessed, it was assessed with um, aspirin. Um, and so, you know, some institutions give a lower dose and some institutions don't give it at all because a lot of times the children are quite irritable, um, they have GI symptoms, they're vomiting, they're not tolerating oral aspirin. Um, and so it's, it's hard to know how much this contributes, um, but it's a standard for us to sort of order that as well. And then supportive care, so diuresis or fluids, depending on the clinical situation, 
a lot of times there is uh, peripheral vasodilation from the inflammatory response, so they may need uh, vasopressors or inotropes. In actuality, the, the vasopressors and inotropes are, are actually pretty rare. They, they do pretty well with just either diuresis or fluids. And then if the fever does not defervesce within 24 or 48 hours of the first dose of gamma globulin, you may need to give a second dose or a second dose with prednisone or other um, immunomodulating agents. Um, we don't, unlike many other um, inflammatory conditions, we don't give prednisone on its own. Um, and that relates to a non-randomized case series where, you know, of the eight children who received prednisone, seven developed coronary aneurysms. Whereas of the you know, 12 children who received gamma globulin, only one developed aneurysms. So since then, no one's wanted to give prednisone as a first line. And if it's given, it's only given with gamma globulin and as a second line if there's no defervescence of fever. But treatment, timely treatment can have a significant impact on outcomes. So 25% coronary aneurysms versus 4%. And then thromboprophylaxis. So not only um, are there potential um, uh, aneurysms, um, but they also uh, tend to develop a, a thrombophilia. Um, and so give low-dose aspirin once they've defervest um, for four to six weeks. And if there are giant, giant aneurysms, then they would also receive either low molecular weight heparin or warfarin. And then outcomes. So most children will have absolutely no coronary complications of Kawasaki disease. And so this is why the incomplete or atypical Kawasaki disease becomes uh, tricky because if they had fever and a rash and a red um, tongue, did they really have Kawasaki disease um, and we treated it and now they don't have coronary changes or was it really something else? Um, and that can be a, a bit of a difficult thing to tease out because we really have no way of knowing. So if they have no coronary aneurysms by the time they um, have their follow-up at four to six weeks, we can discontinue the aspirin and we di discharge them for, from cardiac care um, and send them on their way. So we don't necessarily have good long-term follow-up um, on, on these specific patients. About 20% will have mild dilation at that initial echocardiogram. So either at the time of diagnosis or at um, one or two weeks after onset, where the coronary artery Z score is greater than 2.5. Um, now that's beyond the 99th percentile, but the normal values are based on children who didn't have a fever. So how much of that dilation was really um, uh, in, an inflammatory response and how much of it was just um, the child being sick? Um, it's hard to know, um, but they are on low dose aspirin until their coronary arteries return to normal. And then the vast majority of time, it's within the four to six weeks. So by the time we see them at the four to six week mark, they're back to normal. We can discontinue the aspirin and we can discharge them from clinic. If there's persistent dilation, we'll leave them on the aspirin and follow them up in six months or a year um, and, and reassess at that stage. And, and by and large, they tend to resolve. In the very few cases where they persisted, I do wonder if this was just their normal self, um, that they were beyond the 99th percentile uh, from the beginning, um, but um, this is uh, the protocol here. And then about 4 to 8% despite treatment will develop a coronary artery aneurysm. Um, in these cases, we would start uh, continue with the low-dose aspirin um, for um, thromboprophylaxis. And then if the aneurysms are giant, we'd add um, lumeclic um, heparin and warfarin. Now, if the coronary arteries are small or medium, so less than eight millimeters, um, the likelihood of there being a coronary event, um, such as thrombosis, ischemia, need for intervention, or sudden death is less than 1%. And so if the coronary arteries are less than eight millimeters, um, they are on low-dose aspirin, but only investigated further um, if they have symptoms. Um, otherwise, you're just following them in the long-term because there is potential um, that they may develop um, proliferation along, or along the lumen and may develop um, symptoms down the road. But in the vast majority of cases, they tend, tend to be fine. But when the coronary arteries are giant, so more than eight millimeters, the likelihood of a, a coronary um, event um, is quite high. So between 25 to 40%. Um, and so we're talking about you know, children who are less than five um, having um, ischemic symptoms and then trying to figure out what to do with them. 
Um, and so, you know, we're following them with stress tests, we're following them with angiography, um, and, um, and recommendation is for a cabbage um, if they have symptoms. So this uh, paper from um, the AHA, they publish this every three to five years. So there's regular um, evidence-based updates. I do have to say there hasn't been too many new changes um, in the most recent version compared to um, previous um, and, um, uh, um, and goes through quite an extensive uh, review as well as the recommendations. So this is what I personally do if I have a patient where you know, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, um, the plan, it's quite uh, detailed. Okay, so in summary, uh, Kawasaki disease is a systemic inflammatory response, which can result in coronary artery aneurysms in the sub phase. The clinical diagnosis of Kawasaki disease within the clinical period for intervention, so within the first 10 days of fever, um, can be difficult um, because it overlaps with many other illnesses, including regular viral infections, and there's no gold standard for diagnosis. Um, an echo can't rule out Kawasaki disease, and should be performed serially to look for sub-acute um, complications. Any questions about Kawasaki disease? Okay. Roz, is, Ra, is this something that any pediatric cardiologist would care for, or is, or is there like a clinic uh, where you sort of cohort all these patients? So um, yes, so at SickKids, they're all coordinated into one Kawasaki disease clinic where they have a dietitian um, who can also uh, talk to families about, um, well, I guess all the, all the heart healthy things that adult cardiologists probably talk to patients about, but pediatric cardiologists, not always. So um, Ra? Uh, thank you very much for the very nice summary of this. And as an adult cardiologist, every now and then I run into adult patients or very young patients who um, told me that they have Kawasaki and uh, sometimes they're immigrants, so they don't have a lot of information. Um, so obviously, you know, getting uh, the original uh, investigation record uh, can be very useful, uh, but sometimes it's not accessible. Um, how do you propose adult cardiologists deal with this when they're in their like, early 20s or maybe later on in the rest of their life? What, what do we have to do to follow them? And what other advice should we give them? So if they don't have symptoms um, and they're not currently on an antithrombotic um, agent, um, then they may not actually need um, too much more than, uh, you know, a, a follow-up assessment every one or two years to check in and make sure that they continue to be asymptomatic. Um, so in the San Diego study, they looked at all patients less than 40, so young patients with um, ischemic symptoms and found 5% had evidence of Kawasaki disease. Many of them weren't aware. And when I was doing my uh, search of all the hospitals, um, I actually did identify a few where, you know, adult patients showed up in the emergency room with chest pain and on angiography was diagnosed with Kawasaki disease that they had no recollection of. Um, so I, I think symptoms are, are important, um, particularly in young people. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily investigate an asymptomatic patient um, because I'm not sure that you'd necessarily do anything differently. Yeah. Should, should we, like, let's say, you know, if someone just came to you with, you know, a possible or they claim they have a Kawasaki, should we just do a baseline CT angiogram and see if they have coronary artery aneurysm? Because we, we don't know if they had it or not. Uh, and then if they do, how do we follow them? Um, that's a good question. And I don't, if they're asymptomatic, I'm not sure that I would do an angiogram. I wonder if something like a stress test um, would be helpful. Yeah, because CT angiogram is, is actually relatively non-invasive and you can actually look at the whole coronary anatomy because obviously I, I don't want to do a coronary angiogram or diagnostic one because it's invasive uh, for every single one of those. But, but uh, on the other hand, CT angiogram seems to be quote unquote relatively um, less invasive and more benign, relatively speaking. Is that worth doing routinely or among these patients uh, when we don't know much of the story? I, the only reason I would say probably not is because of all the patients with Kawasaki disease, less than 1% will have giant aneurysms. Got it. Okay. The others will have 
small or none. And so uh, I'm not if they're not symptomatic, I wouldn't I wouldn't I don't know that I'd chase those. Okay. Thank you for the advice because that that's something that I, <laughs> I contemplated. Like one, once a yeah. year, I get one or two because I get lots of Asian immigrants, and uh, you know these kind of that diagnoses actually do come through. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And often I would ask you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk about COVID nineteen. So COVID nineteen in children. So much like SARS, it's not a, something that affects children as severely. Um, and so this is the number of cases uh, reported from China, where you can see the the number of cases in the pediatric population is very low and the fatality is very low. And same in Ontario. So children less than 19 comprise 22% of the population, but only 3% of the positive cases of COVID-19. Um, and so children by and large do not appear to be as severely affected. Now, whether they're not, they're not being tested positive because they're asymptomatic and, and they carry as, as frequently um, or not, it's hard, it's hard to say, um, but clearly they're not as sick. Um, and so in this literature search of uh, severe acute um, respiratory syndrome to um, looking at how it affects the pediatric population, they did a lit search um, and found 815 articles, mainly case reports and, and case series, um, and identified over a thousand pediatric patients, almost all from China. And the vast majority had mild or no symptoms. One, one patient out of the thousand case reports had a severe infection with no deaths reported. So goes along with, um, it doesn't seem to be affecting children as um, severely. This is a study in North America of pediatric ICUs in Canada and the US. So if there's anybody who's gonna be sick in North America, they're probably gonna be included in this study. And in 46 PICUs, 48 children were admitted um, and 83% had a significant pre-existing comorbidity. Um, most had respiratory symptoms, some required invasive ventilation, one required ECMO and there were two deaths. But given the pre-existing comorbidities, I, I think that this was not an unanticipated um, outcome. And this is the data from Ontario. Again, very few cases and very, very few case fatalities in the pediatric population. So the feeling initially was that children are less vulnerable to the virus. Um, and so can we send them back to school? Um, because uh, Two months, three months, it's a long time. And I think that um, parents are starting to get weary of uh, homeschooling for now. And the biggest concern really was more that the children would be a source of uh, virus transmission rather than um, them becoming um, ill. And absolutely, I think that there are things that we can do better in terms of public health to reduce the infectivity um, and transmission of the, of the virus. But then more recently, and this is just from a couple of weeks ago, um, there's a case series reported of uh, hyperinflammatory shock in children with COVID-19 in the UK. Um, these were eight patients between 14, 4 and 14 years of age who presented with fever for four to five days, had conjunctivitis um, and rash. And they had cardiac complications that sounded very much like Kawasaki disease, presented with hypotensive shock, ventricular dysfunction, the coronary arteries appeared echo bright, and one subsequently developed giant aneurysms and ventricular um, arrhythmia resulting in um, the child's demise. Um, However, in this population, only two tested positive for COVID. Um, three were negative for COVID but had contacts, and three were outright uh, negative with no contacts. So whether this was Kawasaki disease um, anyway or related to um, COVID-19 was, was hard to say. This was a study um, published from Bergen in Italy where they really were the epicenter for um, COVID-19. The, they have very few cases of Kawasaki disease. And so they report 19 cases in five years preceding um, this year. And then they noted a 30 fold increase in the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease um, in just the, the first few months of this uh, year alone. They had 10 patients 
50% had classic features of Kawasaki disease. Median age was slightly older than what we would typically see, so 7.5 years instead of less than five. 50% um, had reduced LB ejection fraction, 20% had coronary artery aneurysms. But again, interestingly, only a few tested positive for COVID, um, but serology was positive in 80%. So are we seeing a subacute uh, phase reaction to um, COVID-19, or is it just a coincidence that we have an increased um, uh, Kawasaki-like illness um, in this uh, population in time? So currently there's a public health alert um, and the Canadian Pediatric Society is conducting a surveillance um, to assess um, the association between Kawasaki disease and the COVID-19, um, including investigations and, and active uh, reporting. So recommendations for echocardiography in this population. So if there is severe COVID-19, and suspected Kawasaki disease. So by severe COVID-19, I mean the child is admitted to hospital, then they should undergo an echocardiogram at the time of diagnosis, have a follow-up in one to two weeks, and again in four to six weeks. If someone is positive for COVID-19 but are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms, the recommendation is for no screening echocardiograms at this time. And this is where I think I get calls from, um, from patients, uh, families, and, and particularly when parents or physicians um, wondering if, if they could get an echo um, or should get an echo um, because obviously they're, they're concerned and have heard of, a, of the link. If there is suspected Kawasaki disease, then it would be the usual protocol, but also consider screening for COVID-19 to see if there's an association that, that um, will come out later in time. Any questions here? Okay, so even though children tend not to be as sick with COVID-19, we still don't know um, what the implications uh, would be if more of them became infected. Um, and so ongoing social distancing and quarantine um, for now until we have more information. And as schools open up in other parts of the world, we may get more information um, that will help drive um, more evidence-based uh, recommendations here as well. So our learning objectives were to review the clinical features and cardiac complications of Kawasaki disease. Um, certainly a, a, a pediatric um, condition initially, but obviously um, adults going on to, to um, have carry their complications um, throughout their life. We explored the association newly arising between COVID-19 and Kawasaki disease. Um, and discuss the implications and timing of echocardiography in children with COVID-19. Thank you. Any questions? Ra, it's Kim here. Um, great presentation. Just wondering is, you know, we keep hearing about COVID toes is uh is is this helpful in any way uh do you think it's got something to do with the underlying pathophysiology of what's going on or do you think it's just something to do with the endothelial dysfunction in COVID? Uh, just trying to figure out you know what 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 it means uh all my friends who've got young kids keep telling me their kids have got COVID toes so yeah it's, it's interesting because the rash in kawasaki disease is not vesicular um, um and um, in the subacute phase, they have peeling around the nail beds. Um, so it, it's a different reaction, but I, I wonder if it just relates to the systemic inflammation in, in general. And maybe um, it's, we'll find out more if it's more related to a small vessel arteritis rather than a, a medium vessel arteritis. And have, have you seen much, you know, yourself? Is this like that 30 fold increase you mentioned in Italy? Is this? something that you know the the sick kids is identifying or is it do you think it's just because we haven't had the same bulk you know massive increase in cases in italy it, it isn't obvious what what's your sort of experience so far so no cases in canada um so far so none, um, okay. none. um so yes it, it may be that that bulk um increase but uh 
as you saw, some of the cases um, that were being reported are negative for COVID-19. So yes. I, I wonder if it's just, you know, they would have had Kawasaki disease anyway. Anyway, yep. Ross, Bob Howard, uh, thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, just wondering, you know, they've closed schools. Uh, and the logic is that, you know, the kids, there's no way for six feet of separation to be enforced, um, or at least especially with the young ones. Um, what is What is the evidence that schools are kind of where it, you know, a, a major source for society of, of this virus. I mean, I, I'm, it, it makes sense that it is, but has that, was that the experience in China or, or Italy or anywhere else that, uh, that it really kind of got kids, passed it around and brought it home? And I mean, we're looking to open up schools at some point, COVID will not be gone. Most of us will not have been infected. I mean, how big a risk is the issue of putting kids back together in schools? So most kids, when they start school, will have one febrile illness per month. Um, and so that will happen whether they go to preschool or kindergarten or grade one as their first exposure. In the first one or two years that they start school at any age, they will be sick regularly. Um, and so I think it's based on that rather than any specific evidence with regards to COVID. Um, and I, I mean, my feeling is that they have closed the schools to buy time until they can ramp up testing and infection control measures. Um, now, whether they actually make good use of that time, I'm not sure. Um, but um, I, I think um, that's the concern. So South Korea, just as an example, um, they, they had not started their school year. They had held everything off until uh, the cases had died down. Um, they recently restarted school and then they closed all the schools in Seoul um, this week because they had two cases in one school. So, you know, whether we decide we're going to open schools and close based on the number of cases or um, have a, a, I guess a, a plan in place, I think the back and forth could sometimes be a bit more disruptive than knowing that there's not going to be school. So uh, Ra is Chiming, and uh, I I heard that you know there were some studies in Sweden where um, they they actually kept the school going and noticed that the transmission rate is relatively less, and, and that was actually one of the prevailing thoughts up until about two or three weeks ago when the series of the Kawasaki-like disease that occur in the young children. And uh, uh, as far as my, my world is concerned, uh, Hong Kong just reopened school and uh, everybody is in mask. But uh, again, I, I echoed what um, Bob said, like, you know, there's a lot of uh, questions about uh, uh, the school and, you know, interactions and it, every country is of um, improvising as we move along. So, um, hmm. So I don't know about my question. That was more like a comment. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at baseline, before COVID-19, there are 150 cases of Kawasaki disease every year in Ontario. Right. Um, and so um, that may still be consistent, um, even with COVID-19. Um, and we may actually have less cases now because the kids are not in school. It may increase when they start, but that would have been there anyway. Um, so it, you know, it may not be uh, related at all to the virus per se. Yep. Any any other comments or questions uh, to Dr. Han? So how how is the children hospital doing? There was a small outbreak that uh, was reported. Is it contained now? Yeah, well, well contained. I think they had uh, five cases, um, one patient, her parents, and two nurses, um, and then really no one else on the on the ward or on the floors. Um, and so they're it's very quiet over there right now, um, with everything sort of shut down, but not really having um, uh, admissions for um, severe cases. Yeah. So, so in the adult world, we, we have seen a decrease, substantial decrease in uh, emergency visits uh, in the initial six weeks. I think now it's picking back up a little bit. Uh, 
But uh, in, the, in the children uh, hospital world, have they seen also a similar decrease of um, emergency room or, or hospital visits um, like of emergency nature um, have declined? Absolutely, substantial. The, wow. the emergency room etiquette has, has never been quieter. Now, I, I do agree. I think that sometimes that's not necessarily a good thing because there are you know, kids who need regular care because of their complex medical issues or for routine immunizations and routine well child visits that are not getting that care. Um, and so uh, that may not, not actually be a good thing that things are so quiet. Um, at one point, I think at the beginning, they were talking about potentially turning part of their pediatric ICU into an adult ICU um, to offload um, adult hospitals if need be, but um, that never came to pass. Right. Do, um, this is more of a personal question. I think it may affect all my colleagues as well. We have young, relatively younger children that every summer we look forward to having summer camp so we can ship them away. We can have some <laughs> peace and quiet. Any any thoughts that that um, may or may not happen this year? I, I don't think we're going to get sleepaway camps this year, but uh, they did talk about opening day camps in July. Right. I heard about that. Yeah. Now I'm scared of that. Yeah. <laughs> More homeschooling for the last for the next three yeah. months. I think I think I need some antidepressant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Janice, uh, thanks. That's a great presentation. Do you have any um idea of um the numbers for where children are actual like carriers? Have they done any um stats on that yet? No, that's a very good question. So at St. Michael's Hospital, um, they, we do have a program here called Target Kids, where they follow kids from birth um, all the way out in, in the community, normal, healthy kids, um, during um, episodic um, investigations and um, surveillance, et cetera, to assess for various things. So one of the things they've added is um, COVID screening. So they are regularly screening both the children and the parents um uh, to assess who may be first infected who's infecting who and how many um, asymptomatic carriers there may be in the community so we may have some of that information coming up out of say mics well, that's great thanks because they say they have such mild symptoms you know if they have like a slight runny nose or cold or something um the likelihood of them actually having covid or not we don't know right yeah exactly Do, do you see, um, um, Ra, do you see, um, you know, um, what we call in the adult world collateral damage? Because um, for about six weeks or so, many of our patients stay away, um, adult patients stay away, like even though they have like, you know, typical symptoms of an worsening angina, heart attacks, heart failure, arrhythmia problems. Uh, there have been widespread reports about um, uh, collateral damage because, because people are actually having heart attack or stroke at home. And in fact, we do see also older patients um, with um, uh, a significant uh, cardiovascular kind of disease actually dying, uh, especially in the long-term care. But in, in among the pediatric world with chronic diseases, um, so as to say, do, 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 has the pediatric uh, community noticed that there are uh, people getting sicker or, or you know, not seeking help or, or like you know, having increase in mortality because of the collateral damage effect? I don't know, I don't know about um, increasing mortality, but I, we've seen it in our neonatal population. So babies who are born um, can't get into their family physicians or, or pediatricians, or the community physicians are, are doing these well baby checks um, virtually, which is impossible. You need to like touch the baby and weigh the baby in order to right. assess how well the babies are doing. Um, and so they're winding up in our um, emergency clinics, um, underweight, jaundiced, um, not well, um, uh, but not, so unwell that they need to be hospitalized or, or um, have a um, negative consequence there, but clearly not as well as if everything was uh, running more smoothly. Yeah, and, and how's your virtual virtual visits going? Like with, with Ada, we have been doing virtual visits and uh, most of the time with telephone because it's a hard time for them getting on the videos and things like that. And, uh, but, but telephone seems to work quite well for adults, for most of my patients, unless they're swollen, then I put them on video and check out the swelling. How, how is that working for, for pediatric well, for your virtual visits? So I haven't been doing very many virtual visits. I've been checking in on families uh, by phone, but not as, a, as a, a medical visit. 
Mm -hmm. um, the babies who, I mean, most of the time, if babies need to be seen, I, I need to actually see them do an echo. Um, um, so a couple of babies have been coming every week um, to, to clinic. Um, and particularly important because we're picking up things like critical conditions that need immediate intervention or surgery. Um, but um, everyone else, I've been sort of deferring to, to um, July or August, and hopefully things will be running by then. Yep. Uh, have you seen any um, numbers on um, babies being born with the COVID? So there have been a few case reports where moms are COVID positive and babies are subsequently COVID positive. And sometimes it's a potential sort of in utero transfer, and sometimes it's um, it's afterwards. Um, but um, in terms of symptomatic uh, disease, not so much. So great. Any any other questions? I think we're we're very and. Uh, fortunate situation that we have a pediatric cardiologist who work closely with us and I, I benefit from this relationship because we have clinic uh, often on Friday so I can bounce off all my questions that I don't know especially when my patients are a lot younger and they're in the transitions in between um, you know um, uh, for being followed by pediatric cardiologists and then coming to us as well so, so I think you know we, we, we benefit from this unique advantage so I I do encourage you to seek out her advice and uh, she's very uh, nice and available to help us. So thank you, Ra, over the years for helping all of us. Hopefully I can return yeah. to clinic soon. I'm working on it. Absolutely, absolutely. No, um, no, it's been a fantastic working at St. Mike's and working with the wonderful group here. And if there's any topics or, or um, that you're interested, um, do let me know, I'm happy to present or discuss that with you. Okay, so with that, if you have no further questions, I'll let you all, all of you go five minutes early. So, class Thanks, Ron. That was great. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all. Have a great day. Oh, Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent talk. Thank you.